Now we would like to introduce the concept of a group. We've been talking about group theory, but we haven't even said what a group actually is. So the idea of a group is going to be central to what we've been doing and what we're going to do. So to have a group, I need two things. One of the things I need is a set. And it has to be a non-empty set, so that's requirements. So we have a non-empty set. And the second thing is I need an operation. So it's a mathematical operation. Now, in general, the operation, if we're not going to specify it specifically, we either call multiplication Or, even more generically, sometimes we call it composition. In general, we're going to rate the operation so that it looks like a multiplication, even if it isn't. So, here we have this idea of a group. Um, and the reason why groups are so useful, it's the simplest object that we can do algebra on. So, that's going to become important later on. Um, so, we have a set. And then we have an operation on that set. And once we have these, these operation has to fulfill four axioms. And if it fulfills the four axioms, the set and the operation together form a group. So let's look at the four axioms that are required to have a group. So we have four axioms. So the first axiom is the property of closure. And the closure means that if I take any two elements of the group, any two, and multiply them together, do that group operation, I'm going to get another member of the group. So this idea of closure, um, this is often called, colloquially, the group property. So you see this idea of group property. It's only one of the four, but it's the closure property. So closure is the first of the properties that our set has to follow for it to be a group. The second axiom is we need an identity. The identity. So the identity axis, as we're probably familiar with in multiplication or addition, we know that if we multiply a number by the number one, we get the number back. So in multiplication, our identity in numbers is going to be the number one. If I add the number zero, so if I have the operation of addition, the number zero is the identity element for addition. So we see two common examples of identities in ordinary number systems. So we have to have that to have a group. The third axiom is that I need an inverse. <clears throat> An inverse is an element which multiplied with a given element gives me back the identity. So we'll see that the inverse and the identity are closely related concepts. For example, in the in addition, the inverse of positive five will be negative five. So if I add negative five plus positive five, I get zero, which is the identity element for addition. If I do this in uh, for multiplication, the inverse of 5 would be 1 fifth because 1 fifth times 5 gives me 1, which is the identity element for multiplication. Last but not least, our fourth property that has to be satisfied for our group to be a group is associativity. So, for example, if I have three elements A, B, and C. If I group A and B first and then do C, I get the same result as if I had grouped B and C first and then done A. So associativity refers to the grouping of elements and the order of operation. Now notice this, what this is not the same thing as. So this is associativity, but notice this is not the same thing as saying that A times B is equal to B times A. If this is true, if AB is equal to BA, we have a property called commutativity, and then we have a special type of group called an abelian group. So this may or may not be true. In general, this will be not true. 
So for most of the groups that we're going to deal with, it will not be true that AB equals BA. So commutativity is not required for a group. So let's look at these in a little bit more detail. In particular, uh, why have we been talking so much about matrices, particularly 3x3 three three matrices? One of the nice features of 3x3 three three matrices, let's look at our 3x3 three three matrices. That if I take the set of all 3x3 three three matrices, and particularly the matrices that are said to be non-singular, okay, so we say non-singular matrices, and the reason for including this requirement is that a matrix that is non-singular has an inverse. So we need that. Remember, that is the property number three for a group. The, each element has to have an inverse. So by eliminating all three by three matrices that don't have inverses, we will remove the problem. So within the set of three by three matrices, the operation is matrix multiplication. So if I include the set of three by three matrices that are non-singular with the operation of matrix multiplication, I form a group. And we want to show that uh, it satisfies the principles, uh, the requirements of group theory. So the first thing is we need an identity. And we've actually already seen what the identity looks like for three by three matrices. It's a matrix with one along the diagonals and zero every place else. So right there is our identity element for three by three matrices. Now we can show more specifically that this works. We saw that it's the identity when it's multiplied by a three by one column vector. So it's the point X, Y, Z, we saw and proved that that was the identity. We haven't proved that it's going to be the identity if I multiply it times a three by three matrix. So let's take a look at that to show that that's true. So let's have our identity matrix here. And then we can multiply it, have it act upon some generic three by three matrix. So let's look at what that would be. Let's just call it A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. So we have the nine different elements of our matrix, which may or may not be different, but this is a generic three by three matrix. And we want to see what the result of this multiplication is going to be. So this is the most complicated example uh, that we're going to have to deal with in group theory as a chemist is the multiplication of three by three matrices with three by three matrices. So recall that when we multiply matrices, it's going to be the first column, the first row. So we have first row is one, zero, zero, multiplied by the first column, which is Z A, D, G. So we have one times A plus zero times D plus zero times G is going to give me A. And since it's the first row times the first column, the result ends up in the first row worst column. So now I multiply the first row times the second column. So it's one, zero, zero times B, E, H. One times B plus zero times E plus zero times H gives me B. And since it's the first row times the second column, the result goes in the first row, second column. And last but not least, we have one zero zero times CFI. So one times C plus zero times F plus zero times I gives me C. So that gives me the first row. And I can continue. Here's the second row, zero, one, zero. And now we're gonna multiply the second row times the first column. So I have zero times A plus one times D plus zero times G gives me D. The second row times the second column, zero times B plus one times E plus zero times H gives me E. Last but not least, the second row times the third column gives me zero times C plus one times F plus zero times I gives me F. Last but not least here, we have the third row times the first column, zero times A plus zero times D plus one times G gives me G. For the third row times the second column, 
0 times b plus 0 times e plus 1 times h gives me h. The third row times the third column is 0 times c plus 0 times f plus 1 times i equals i. And we notice that when we multiply this matrix times any generic 3 by 3 matrix, we get the matrix back. So this demonstrates clearly that this matrix actually is the identity. So in any group uh, involving 3 by 3 matrices, we need to have the identity element. Now, what we're not going to show here in detail, but what is, is true is that if I multiply any 3 by 3 matrix, so uh, we won't write a generic matrix out here, but so if I just take any 3 by 3 matrix, we'll call it A, times any other 3 by 3 matrix, call it B, I'm guaranteed, since I have 3 rows times 3 columns, times 3 rows times 3 columns, the result of this has to have 3 rows and 3 columns. So, uh, by the properties of matrix multiplication, we're guaranteed to get closure. So, if we multiply any two 3 by 3 matrices, we're guaranteed to get another, perhaps distinct, 3 by 3 matrix. For the third requirement of group theory, the idea of the inverse, we will not prove that in detail, but the mere fact that we've selected only those matrices, the non-singular ones, that have an inverse, we're including this already. So if you look up in works on linear algebra, you can see a more complete description of which, how to know if a matrix has an inverse and the various different ways to compute the inverse. Last but not least, we have the requirement for associativity. And again, this is a feature which is already given in the properties of three by three matrices. So if I have three three by three matrices, A, B, and C. I can group them the following way. If I group A and B first, and multiply by C, or multiply A times the product of B and C, I get exactly the same result. So for three by three matrices, have the property of associativity. So what we've shown is, at least in a quick sketch sort of way, that if I take the set of all three by three matrices that are non-singular, they form a group. Now, it's going to turn out to be a group that is infinite in size. So we can have groups that have an infinite number of elements, or we can have groups that have a finite number of elements. In group theory for chemistry, we're going to be most interested in the finite groups, typically groups with 48 or fewer elements. So we're going to be looking at a very small subset of all the 3 by 3 matrices. The convenient thing for us is that we've already shown that we can represent symmetry operations as three by three matrices and see quite clearly the effects that those will have. We will notice that we can multiply three by three matrices using the rules of matrix multiplication to get another three by three matrix. We can often recognize by looking at that matrix exactly which symmetry operation to which it corresponds. So we're gonna be able to use what we know from linear algebra as a convenient assistance in deriving results in group theory. The key idea for us also is that the symmetry operations for a molecule will form a group. So that's the, the, the really key idea, which we haven't stated explicitly yet, is this idea that the set of all symmetry operations for any molecule will form a group. And what we need to do is figure out which group is it. And once we know to which group the symmetry operations of a molecule apply, we can use various results from group theory to derive the chemical properties of that compound. So that's the, the key idea that's going to be in the back of our minds is that we're using the mathematics to help us determine chemical properties ultimately. So this is the end of our introduction, introduction to group theory. At the beginning of the course, uh, for, for episode number one, further results uh, theoretically, will be at the end of each episode. So the first few parts of each episode will demonstrate the paper constructions so that we can visualize the symmetry operations. And then more of the theoretical results will be demonstrated in the later parts for each particular episode. So again, I ask you to subscribe if you can so that you won't miss any episodes. And I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.
if you can so that you won't miss any episodes. And I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.